Welcome back to the garage. We're continuing work on project unintended spending the 1987 Audi 5000 CS Quattro that I purchased not too long ago that's full of problems. In the previous video, we replaced the timing belt and water pump and discovered that the heater core is pretty much clogged. If you're just now joining this project series, be sure to check the playlist in the description below so you can see how we ended up where we are today. The focus of today's video is replacing that heater core and it is located in kind of an HVAC assembly that is kind of in this general area. I don't know exactly how I'm going to go about fishing it out of there, but I know I need to at least remove the wiper arms, remove that cowl panel, and probably remove some things on the interior. Now before I even do that, I need to start shop backing all of this kind of tree debris type stuff that's collected in here because I don't want it to get into places it shouldn't. So we're gonna start with that and continue on. evacuated an immense amount of leaves and the dirt that had built up under that cowl panel and now we get our first glimpse of where the heater core is this is kind of our HVAC box right here and right here we can see hoses going into right here and that's the heater core so the next challenge is how do I get this box out we'll see Got it out, and what a huge job that was. I didn't think I was gonna get it out, to be honest. It was really stuck down in there. A combination of multiple things holding it in place. One, like the gasket that seals around the firewall there was sticking it in place, and then it's just a super tight area to try and pull it out. Um, I did definitely have to loosen this AC line to give me that little extra bit of space, but Look how much leaves are cut underneath there. So obviously I've got to vacuum out what I can. It's interesting how you can see directly into the interior of the car now. So that seal that seals that box to the firewall is critical. So I will be replacing that seal with some sort of butyl tape or something similar to make sure it stays watertight. That would be the last place you want water coming in. So the HVAC box is vacuum operated. So there were three or four vacuum lines I had to disconnect. One of them did break, but I think I can shorten it up and make it work still. Just a lot of things that I'm keeping in my mind about how I'm going to reassemble this because it is, it is not straightforward. The service manual has absolutely no information on how to do this. And honestly, nowhere online has a very step-by-step -step procedure. So you just gotta make it up as you go. Now for the box itself, I'm pretty sure this has been removed at some point in the past just because of the haphazard layout of that gasket there. It looks like someone's been in here once before. But also the fact that the heater core is just kind of loose in there. Maybe that's how it's supposed to be. I don't really know. I'm not 100% sure how I'm going to separate this box. Unfortunately, they don't give you an access panel to just unbolt and pull the heater core out. So you do have to split this case. It's too pieces that are sandwiched together. And here's your vacuum op actuators that operate the flaps for this system. Let's see. Pretty, pretty cool. It's actually 
pretty nightmarish for a car this old just because anything can break at any point in time it's just old plastic not sure what all i need to remove i'm gonna take lots of pictures of this process just to make sure i can put it back together all right let's get started <laughs> That is the HVAC box separated and I definitely disassembled more than I needed to do as far as the little levers on all the flaps just because it's not clear how to disassemble those things. There's a lot of hidden uh, Phillips head screws that was the main culprit of being or of having difficulty separating that but it also looks like you need to pull off those levers to even separate the boxes but in fact you don't. You don't need to do that. But that's what you get when there are no instructions. Anyways, blower motor's in good shape. I'll clean these up a little bit before I install the new heater core, but let's take a look at the old one. Over here on the left is clearly the old heater core, and there was still some coolant left in it, which I've drained since then. And here is the new one over here. Um, so if we take a look at the old heater core, you can see it says, made in West Germany. That's pretty much an indication this is original to the car. But something that really shocks me is the heft of this thing. I mean, it is, it feels made of stone almost. Like it is heavy. And I don't know if that's because it's chocked full of like sand, like the stop leak, or if it's just the metal is so much more dense than this heater core, which is extremely lightweight feeling. Now, something I've noticed as I've been looking at this are the inlet and outlet pipe diameters. They're quite a bit different, so I need to make sure that those hoses will actually mate up to this one okay before I reassemble everything. But before I install this in the car, I need to put some of this insulating tape around there so it stays put. It did come with that here in the packaging. Not very much of it though, so we'll see how far that gets us. Before I go and reassemble everything underneath the cowl here, 
I want to fill the cooling system up, but before I do that, I want to pull a vacuum on it to make sure there are no air leaks. I would hate to find that that heater core doesn't actually seal up after I've filled the cooling system up with coolant. So to do that, and in fact, this cooling system does require you to pull a vacuum to get all the air out of it. You have to use a tool like this, which I've had to use on a few other cars. Um, and what you do is you hook it up to the coolant reservoir and you hook it up to your air compressor and it pulls a vacuum on the whole system. Alright, so now the system is under vacuum with about, uh, about 22 PSI, or negative 22 PSI. And you can see that all of the coolant hoses are compressed or like that, as, as you would expect as a vacuum is being pulled. Um, again, the whole system is under a vacuum right now. And this is really the best way to um, fill a cooling system the first go. It also helps you identify if you have any leaks anywhere and it looks like everything is sealing up good around the heater core. So what you want to do is kind of leave this for about 10 minutes or so just to make sure there's no air getting into the system. You want to make sure it can hold that vacuum. If it can do that then you should be good to top it up with coolant. Alright so that's held for a little over 10 minutes with no drop that I could see. So now we're going to fill the system up with some genuine Audi G12 Evo coolant. So this is kind of like that pink stuff. And how you do that is you drop this piece, which is attached to the mechanism here. Um, this is just like a sump. You put it into your gallon jug of coolant. Then you flip this valve on and it starts sucking it in. Now something you want to do before you just open that valve is to prime this line because otherwise you're going to be sucking in a bunch of air. So you do that by turning on the air compressor line, pulling a vacuum, Alright, now that that line's primed, now you can just open it up, and it'll fill the system. You gotta make sure that you keep tabs on your the, level, the coolant level in the bottle so you don't actually run it dry and introduce air back into the system. I'm not sure how much this is going to take, I have about two and a half gallons of this stuff, so hopefully that's enough. We will find out. All right, so that's the entire cooling system topped up from the heater core to the block to the radiator to all of the other channels in the cooling system. It's all purged of air. It took just over two gallons of coolant, so I had just enough to do this. Alright, and with that, the heater core is installed and the coolant is topped up. Now, if you have one of these Audi 5000s and you need to replace the heater core, really consider whether you want to go through with that job. That was probably the most 
One of the most frustrating jobs I've ever done it requires a ton of patience, and I was just about to run out of it myself. Um, I've replaced a lot of reheater cores in my day, and I've had to remove dashboards to get to them and all of that. Honestly, removing a dashboard is easier than taking it out on this car. It's just, it's such tight quarters, and you have to force things out. Not to mention you have to deal with vacuum lines and cables that come through grommets through the firewall and then a, a rubber boot that directs air to the back seat. Basically you have to monitor 10 things when you're pulling it out and putting it back in. Keep on top of all of them just so that they all happen all at the same time. It is a mental somersault trying to get that heater core in and out of it. Not to mention splitting the box open to actually get to the heater core. That's a whole separate bit of fun in itself. So that's done though on this car. Now we're going to tackle some of the other issues we were going to address in this video, such as removing this trickle charger at the front of the car here. I don't know if it's operational, it definitely has wires cut, so I assume it's not. And then we're gonna go over here and remove this obsolete radar detector. I already started pulling things out and I noticed the main cable has been cut. Uh, so someone obviously was trying to diagnose it at one point and their uh, <laughs> diagnosis stopped at just cutting the cable, which is kind of hilarious and then clean up all the grounds that are along the front of the car. We've got some down in here looking pretty rusty. And then we've got some over here as well. So I decided not to take or try to take these two ground wires off. They were fighting me and I started hearing some cracking going on. So these tabs go into this blue aluminum plate right here. It's like anodized aluminum. It's pretty neat. These tabs are sealed with some sort of epoxy. And as I was turning this, the nuts are so rusted on there that it was starting to crack that epoxy. And I'm like, eh, I don't want to do anything irreversible here. So I got this one off, cleaned it up a little bit, but I just went in with my ohm meter and was checking that I could at least get an open circuit showing here and I am so this is a uh, good grounds right now even though they look kind of rusty so at least now that we've checked those out I'm gonna move on to the starter wire that uh, that is in place so the original starter wire so the wire that goes basically from the ignition switch relay to the starter solenoid that tells the starter to engage uh, is very corroded and it's been bypassed by a separate wire that goes from the dashboard from a auxiliary switch to the starter as kind of a bypass mechanism. I want to put the original ignition switch back into play so I'm going to see if I can't replace the original wire that goes to the starter motor solenoid. Alright so I've pulled the wire out far enough I believe I've cut the sheath off so we can actually get a good view of the condition of the wire and as you can see that is in very poor shape when you flick it like this it's like obviously it's very corroded all the way up the wire I'm wondering if I can't see good wire if I cut it here it's a very good chance that this is the reason the ignition switch was not able to turn over the starter motor because yeah electrons aren't gonna flow very good through that So I started cutting back the sheath on this wire, and I tell you what, it doesn't start to look awesome anywhere. <laughs> Probably, what is that, a foot and a half I've taken off. And at the very least, it's looking metallic and shiny up here. It doesn't look like copper anywhere in this segment. So I'm just gonna say that might be the way the wire looks. I don't have a whole lot further I can go before I start getting into the, kind of the main wiring harness here. So what I'm gonna do is, hook up my multimeter to this and ground it and see if I get 12 volts when I turn the ignition on to the start position. If I do, then I know that at least the circuit is live and that just the wire down here was the reason it wasn't getting power to the starter solenoid. And if that works, then I will just 
cut it off here and tap it into the new wire, the bypass wire, and just say that's my new circuit. But we have to see if this wire is even live anymore to begin with. So I've got my multimeter on set on direct volts there, and then I've got a alligator clip mounted to the wire in question, and then I've got another alligator clip mounted to the cylinder head, which is a good ground. So now I'm going to have my friend Nate turn the ignition on to the start position and see if we don't see 12 volts come across here. All right, Nate, go ahead and turn it on. Okay, you can stop. So an interesting thing can be seen here that we are getting a small tiny blip of voltage coming through here, but it's nowhere near 12 volts clearly. So I think that the problem lies elsewhere. I don't think it's our wire here. I think we have a good enough connection there to at least see partial voltage come through. So we're gonna have to go further upstream. And I've looked at the wiring diagram a little bit and it says the next point in this system is a anti-theft solenoid, which is in the, the fuse box solenoid panel by the windshield. So let's go take a look at that. Here's the fuse panel, and looking at the wiring diagram, this spot number seven right here is supposedly where an anti-theft fuse would be located. Clearly there's nothing there. So after doing some research, um, some owners of Audi 5000 Quattros have said, hey, well, if your relay, anti-theft relay fails, we'll just bridge the two pins, the pin 36 and pin 38, and it'll basically bypass the fuse and you can get voltage down to that starter wire. Well, interestingly enough, there's already a bridge here and it honestly looks kind of factory. It doesn't look like some shade tree mechanic type jobber right there. So I'm wondering if some of these cars just didn't come with an anti-theft relay. But to verify that we are getting power to at least that spot, I'm going to hook up the positive side of my voltmeter to right there. And I've got the negative side hooked up to the cylinder head for ground. And we're going to turn the car on to the start position again and see if we don't get voltage there. All right, Nate, go ahead and turn it on. Okay, go ahead and stop. So we can see that the next point of failure in the system, which would be that relay location, is getting the same voltage as the wire down by the starter. So that tells me that potentially our problem is the ignition switch itself. All right, fast forward to removing the steering wheel and the instrument cluster and switch gear there at the front. I didn't catch this on video because it's pretty standard across all cars. It's just a few Phillips head screws and you just kind of pull things out. Um, I did match mark the steering wheel so I knew where center was when I put it back into place, but nothing out of the ordinary there. Now, trying to get to this ignition switch, you do have to remove all these components because it's down in here. It's this component right there. And after doing a little bit of reading, um, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but there's a little red mark there and that's just like some sealant that you kind of scratch out of there and there should be like a set screw that allows you to remove the ignition switch out the back. So I'm gonna try that and see if we can't take that ignition switch over to the bench and clean the connections within. Okay, so I got the ignition switch out, and externally it doesn't look bad or anything like that. A lot of grease all over it, which I assume was at one point dielectric grease. But if we look in there, we can see some kind of metallic grease that has gotten all over the place. And that's just lubrication for the lock cylinder, or for the lock switch or maybe from the lock cylinder, but I'm wondering if that grease has gotten down in here and kind of gotten onto the contacts. So just to give you an idea how this works, the lock cylinder has a tab that protrudes out here, and I think maybe even the end of the key pushes into this. And when you turn your key to the on position, it's like that. And then when you turn it to start, you can see that it ratchets forward. And there's a contact, you can kind of hear it switching there. And I'm wondering if that contact is gummed up and not allowing a complete circuit. 
So I'm going to do what's totally not recommended. Usually you just replace this part, but I'm going to try and reverse assemble it by pulling out these tabs and see if we can't disassemble these halves and see the contacts within there. All right, so that is the ignition switch put back together. There was definitely some blackened connections in there, which I shined up with some Scotch-Brite pad and some electronics cleaner. Then I reassembled it with some dielectric grease so that's well lubricated. And the action is just like before. So we'll see if we now have electricity going through there. Let's put it back in the car, find out. Well, unfortunate news on the ignition switch rebuild attempt. I don't think it worked, but in positive news, I do still think it's the ignition switch that's the culprit. And let's see why. So after reviewing the wiring diagram, I located the pin on the ignition switch connector that goes right to the starter motor solenoid. So I've connected my multimeter directly to that pin and we've got it here and I've grounded it to a known good ground spot here in the body. And when I turn the key on, we can clearly see that a tiny bit of voltage is making it through there, but when I attempt to turn the key, absolutely no voltage is making it over. So, I think the ignition switch is just worn out, something within it is broken. I did notice when I was disassembling it that there was a little peg with a spring on it and the spring was broken and I wonder if that spring is supposed to put pressure on a plunger or something I didn't I didn't see a better place to put that or or something that looked out of place but um, I think that's probably the culprit so it looks like I'm just going to have to order a new ignition switch I did find a new old stock one online so I'll put in an order and hopefully it comes here soon all right, so it's been about a week and a half since I ordered a new ignition switch, but it is finally here. I am so fortunate to have found a new old stock ignition switch for actually a reasonable price. It was like $16 after shipping. You can't go wrong with that. Let's get this thing installed in the car and make sure we're now seeing voltage where we think we should be. So I've put the new ignition switch in there and we can see my voltmeter is hooked up out there with the positive on that uh, wire that goes to the starter motor and then the negative hooked up to the cylinder head. So I'm gonna put the key in here, turn it to the on position. Well, you'll notice I'm not in the car anymore and I've got something very interesting here on the bench. So I went to plug in my new ignition switch into the ignition barrel steering wheel lock mechanism, which is where it houses right here, hooked up the wiring harness, turned the key to start, and I still had the same problem. No current was going through the power wires, going to the starter solenoid. Talk about a major disappointment. I mean, how could anything else be going wrong if not the ignition switch? I put a brand new one in there. I don't know how many more twists and turns you as viewers can handle, but I am here and it just scratching my head. What in the world is going on with this thing? So the only component left in the system that could possibly have gone wrong or worn out is this steering lock mechanism that houses the, the ignition switch barrel. And at the back of it, where the ignition switch actually mounts, we've got this protrusion type thing that pops out when you put the key in. And here I'll show you, I'll put the key in this. You can see how this works. Let's see, when you put the key in and turn it, 
that thing protrudes outward. And when you pull the key out, it retracts. And basically what this is doing is it's actuating this barrel on the ignition switch. You can see how it keys into that. And it just rotates it. And when you rotate it all the way, it basically connects two contacts in this and it sends power to the starter motor uh, solenoid. However, what I'm finding is that this inner piece must be worn down enough so that it doesn't get a full rotation on the ignition switch to connect the contacts. Now, unfortunately, what we've got here is a non-serviceable bulky part that you s I don't think I'm going to be able to find a replacement. And if I did find a replacement, who's to say it's in any better condition than this one? It just amazes me that somehow this aluminum center pin has worn down when it's in contact with a plastic piece. It just goes to show that these materials, even though they're very different, apparently sit share a similar hardness. So that's unfortunate, it's very unfortunate. So I've done the only thing I know how to do, and that's to try and build up some material on the inside of this pin that sticks out so that it can get a full rotation on the ignition switch. So I've tried two methods, one that has already failed and I've abandoned, and that's trying to use a soldering iron to build up solder on one of the faces of this pin so that it effectively close up the gap and do a complete turn on the ignition switch. That didn't work, the solder didn't stick to the aluminum. I mean, that goes without saying, but I just thought I'd try my luck anyways. So instead, what I've resulted to is using some aluminum gaffer tape like this and cut it into a thin strip. And I've wrapped this pin in this stuff. And what it's done is given a fraction of a millimeter more thickness around the entire perimeter of that pin. So that very well might have built up enough material to get a full revolution or full turn on this ignition switch. Let's give it a shot and see what happens. What we're going to do is obviously put this back into the barrel like so. Then we need to secure this set screw to hold it in place. So now that is in locked position. You can see when you put the key in, you can hear it hitting the contacts, but even though you can hear that, it doesn't mean it's actually completing a circuit. So how we're going to verify that is take my multimeter here. We're going to put it on the resistance reading or the ohm side of things. And I know that this is my constant power pin because I've already looked through the wiring diagram and looked at the wires on the back side of this. So I know that that is my constant power. So power is always flowing through that. And then we have our starter motor solenoid pin, which is right here. So the idea is if I turn the key all the way to start, these two pins are now connected to one another. And our ohm reader should show that we have continuity when we flip that over to start. So right now it's not showing continuity. It's showing one an open circuit, but let us put the key in, turn it to start. And voila. So again, turn the key to on. And there we go. We have continuity in that circuit now. That is the missing link. So I've bought a new ignition switch, likely for no reason other than it's nice to have a new part in there. But the real failure on this is the this lock barrel itself. The little pin, it just wears away and it no longer is able to get the full rotation on that ignition switch. This is the sort of thing that you have to just MacGyver your way through it because you're dealing with a car that simply doesn't have parts available for it anymore. Not to mention, if this part was even available, it'd probably be in the hundreds of dollars to buy anyway. This is just a simple fix that hopefully will last for a decent amount of time. Now, in order to get the steering lock mechanism out of there, I did have to uh, drill out a safety screw or a, a shear away screw that kind of mounts in there. It's like a set screw that holds it into the steering column. So I did have to get out the Dremel tool with the cutting disc on it and I made kind of a flathead slot on the top and just use a flathead screwdriver to extract that bolt. And then I was able to finagle this out of there. I did have to kind of pry it out, but it did come out and here we are. I didn't get it on a video just because I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna get around this. I just went ahead and figured it out. So. That is what you got to do. Let's get this back in the car and hopefully we see a complete circuit in the car. All right, so I've put the ignition switch and steering lock back in. So we're going to turn it to the on, turn this to the start. 
we have 10.6 volts or so showing up from that wire over there. So I think this is still a little bit finicky because I had to go in there and kind of MacGyver it. I'm not fully confident that this is going to fix it permanently. So I'm gonna start searching for a new or at least a known good steering lock. And because of that, I'm not going to remove this bypass switch quite yet, um, just because it could be that I need to use this again. Now, I'm going to go ahead and reassemble the entire interior and hook up a new lead to that wire that we've stripped in the engine bay. So I'm not super proud of what I've got going on here, but it will work for the time being just to prove that the ignition switch is working. So I've got the original starter wire right here and I've had to extend it and I have bridged it with the bypass starter wire. Now the idea here is if I'm using the ignition switch, then I will be completing the circuit through this bypass wire. And if for ever, whatever reason the ignition switch starts to fail, then I can go back to using the bypass switch, which will go through the bypass wire right there. So they're both using the same wire, but only one circuit will be live at any given time. So let's give this a shot and see if the starter turns the engine over. Hmm. Well, shoot. Looks like all that work is still led to nothing. <laughs> Fortunately, this still works, but um, yeah, apparently the hours I've put into trying to make this ignition switch work is for nothing, at least until I can find a new steering lock mechanism that perhaps would allow this to work uh, consistently. But also there could be a problem with the fact that not a full 12 volts is making it down to that starter solenoid. And I'm not sure where it's losing that voltage. It's getting 10 and a half. So, I mean, a lot of it is making it there, but I can't see where the voltage drop is happening. So, hmm. I have to think on that for a little while, but for now I've got this. And I think I'm going to just put the interior back together and just call it good for now. All right, so that is the front end of the car put back on. I will say putting that bumper back on was a real bear. If you're gonna do this yourself, just make sure you line it up straight before you try to push it on. Uh, don't worry about trying to get the clips on the side. If you try to start there, you will never get this thing installed. It is tough as heck. So if you joined us at the beginning of this series, you'll notice that this headlight looks brand new now, and that's because it has been replaced. I decided to not try and restore the broken headlight that was trapping water. Instead, I just found a nice used one and threw it in there. Now, replacing the headlight assemblies on this does require removing the bumper, removing the grill, and to get to it. It's an intricate web of plastic tabs and screws that you just can't see unless you get all that removed. So I put that in there and I've installed new halogen bulbs because the one in that side had blown up and burn out because water had gotten in there. However, the company Bosla has sent me new LED headlight bulbs that we're gonna try installing in this. I'm really curious about this because I've seen them out there and they're supposedly much brighter, a much better bulb, especially when you're dealing with an older car that doesn't have great lighting to begin with. So we're gonna see what the halogen bulbs look like right now and then we'll swap in these LED bulbs. So as you can see, you have your standard halogen, like yellowy looking lights. I mean, they're fine, but now let's see what these LED lights can really improve upon. So here we have the LED headlights made by Bosla. And these are 9,004 high and low beam style headlights. They're all one bulb. And something unique about these bulbs is that have a way to change the color on the fly. So it looks like you can change it from a white to warm yellow to yellow to warning flashing. And I'm not 100% sure how you do that. I think it's cycling the headlights on and off, something like that. We'll just have to figure that out. But really what I'm just looking for is a brighter uh, light at night. So we'll go for this white 6500K. So if we unbox this, see it's a nicely packaged item that comes with instructions on how to install these, although I'm pretty sure installation's pretty straightforward. 
In here we have the adapter harness. So this is for the Audi's 9004 bulb harness. And then we have what looks like a ballast here that we'll have to find a way to secure in the engine bay. And then we have a plug that I believe just goes right into the bulbs themselves. So if we look at the bulbs, they have a removable glass kind of case right here that we'll need to remove before we install these in the headlight housings. But otherwise, the structure, at least where it seals up against the headlight housing, is exactly like the halogen ones. But you'll notice there's this bulky piece on the back end, and it is a heat sink with also a little electric fan to cool the bulb down when it's on. So it's really a pretty nicely engineered piece. This is all aluminum down in here, no plastic parts. It's really nicely constructed. So you'll see this is the Looks like a six pin or, or rather five pin connector that we just go right into the ballast. And then you screw this to kind of secure it. And there you are, you've got a bulb ready to be installed. Looks like this one actually cracked, so you gotta be careful. This is glass after all. I'm just gonna go ahead and remove that so I don't cut myself. So if we compare against the old bulb, you see the back connector is the exact same. And then if we look at where it slots into the headlight housing, got these little cutouts that look to be correctly spaced. So we shouldn't have any problems installing this. So again, the connector on the old style bulb is part of the bulb itself, but this uses an adapter harness. All right, let's go get these installed. So while we're in here, we can actually see why water got into the old housing and it's because of this ring that secures the bulb to the housing. It was straight up missing. So the bulb was not able to stay in place and water just got in. So again, these are the new bulbs that I just installed and then I was offered these LED bulbs, so why not? So something I just realized is there's no way to get this ring over the bulb itself. Uh, this back piece is wider than the ring but if you play around with it you can see that you can actually pull this bit off slide it off it's sealed with a couple looks like silicone o-rings there so once you've done that then you can slide this it sits in like so All right, so that's all connected. I'll have to find a way to secure this. I guess I could zip tie it, kind of like it's been done there, and at least keep it out of the way and keep it from dangling. So we'll have to see there. All right, so that's both sides installed. I just use a zip tie to kind of hold it here. And that's that side. I just secured it to this AC line, the metal part of it, because I know these probably get pretty hot. Now all that's left to do is just try them out and see if the lighting is vastly improved. Well, it doesn't take a genius to see that. Those are much more powerful headlight bulbs. Now, I know this isn't exactly a scientific test, I can tell you that there's a very clean cutoff point when I'm seeing this up against my garage wall, where before with the halogen lights, I mean, it would be, the light didn't even really make it to the garage wall with all, since it's daylight out, but these are so powerful, you can actually see them against the garage wall and, and pretty well at that. And what I was doing there to change the color of the light, I was just flicking on and off the headlights, and apparently if you do that within five seconds, then it's like switching it to a different color. So if you just leave them off for five seconds and you turn them back on, uh, it will reset to the default uh, color, which is just bright white like this. So those are really, really nice. And the high beams look really powerful. I am happy with these things for sure. I think this is definitely a, a worthwhile retrofit option for a classic car that doesn't either have projector lenses or certainly doesn't have an HID or Xenon system within it. If you're interested in seeing where you can buy these for yourself, check the link in the description below. Um, otherwise, car's back on the ground looking good. And let's give it a shot and make sure that timing belt went in correctly. I don't doubt that it did, but 
You just never know until you start it to back up. Now, unfortunately, a failure of this video was fixing this ignition switch so that would actually turn the engine over. Um, again, I will just have to find a replacement ignition lock to actually get that working. that the low coolant light no longer shows up, which is directly correlated to the car now having coolant in it. Imagine that. You can see we don't have any coolant leaks, so that is successful. Nothing wrong here in the belt area. Obviously no vacuum leaks because it's running pretty well. So something you may have noticed just then is how quickly the car started up and no I didn't have it running before taking that video, it actually did start that fast from a cold start. So what changed? Well I replaced the old fuel pump with a brand new Bosch unit and with these pumps comes a new check valve that supposedly will keep pressure in the lines from the fuel pump all the way up to the engine when the engine is off. Now I'm not fully confident this has fixed all of the long laborious start problems that I had been experiencing from, with this car, but it certainly has helped improve them as you can see in that shot. Now I didn't get that on video because honestly there was no way I could even get the camera in to show me replacing the fuel pump. There's not a whole lot to it so long as you can get it out of the tank. You have to get into the trunk, you have to crawl in there. It's a, it's a nasty operation, but uh, I just went ahead and did it. You know, these things are about $120. Definitely worth just trying it out and seeing if it improves anything. Now my trials and tribulations with the fuel system aren't going to end there. In the next video, we will likely be taking on replacing all of the fuel injectors, as well as a few other things we have to change out while we're in there. So that will be in the next video. I have the parts here, so I'm ready to go on that. As for the heater core we installed, the heat now definitely works. You can feel hot air coming through the vents and it's not just because it's literally 100 degrees outside. The coolant is now circulating through a completely unclogged fresh heater core so we're good to go there. I'm happy with that result. So as always thanks so much for watching and we'll see you all again next time.